so glad that you have decided to join us this weekend. How many of you are cheering for the Kansas City Chiefs tonight? How many of you are cheering for the San Francisco 49ers? How many of you don't care? How many of you are depressed Cowboys fans and you can't do nothing? You just... Some of you are so depressed, you're like, ooh. Hey, I'm so, so, so excited that you decided to give us a little bit of your time this weekend. We don't take for granted that you got up this morning, got dressed, got your kids here. Some of you got your kids in here. Uh, we, we appreciate you. Um, I have an assignment today to help you accomplish the one God gave you. Today, uh, we are going to be talking about a subject that is near and dear to my heart on the subject of obedient. If you would, I would love for you to go to Genesis chapter 2, and my Bible is page 2. I don't know what it is in yours. Genesis chapter 2, starting in verse 8, Scripture says this, says, the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed, and out of the ground the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Verse 15, then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you should not eat, for in that, in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. For those of us that may be unfamiliar with the Genesis narrative, God creates man and woman, puts them in a garden. And by the way, the, this garden has lots of trees, lots of food, lots of fruit. And by the way, it's perfect, okay? Perfect food. God says, hey, you can have as much as you want except this one. And I don't know about you, but when somebody says that to me, all I want is this one. You know what I mean? My wife and I went out to eat the other night, and uh, the, the waiter came to us and said, hey, uh, man, a couple of our chefs are sick. I hate, hate to be the bearer of bad news, but here's a list of items that aren't on the menu. They're on the menu, but they can't be served tonight. So you, here's all the things you can't have. And every time she said something out loud, I thought to myself, that's exactly what I want. I want it more now because I can't have it. Um, I don't know what it is in us that sometimes just always wants the thing that we can't have. It's like God sometimes wants us to go this direction, but we just somehow end up going this direction. I love how the Apostle Paul put it in Romans chapter 7. He says, we know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. Now, here we go. Verse 15. This is where it gets good. He says, I do not understand what I do for what I want to do. I do not do, but what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. Sometimes you got to make it do what it do, baby. You get like he's trying to figure out what he's trying to do, but he finds himself getting in doo-doo every time he tries not to do it. And I love, I just love how the Apostle Paul put it, too, because he's going, hey, I'm a mess. Okay, let me just put that out there. I'm a mess. But don't worry, it's not me, it's the sin living in me. You should try that the next time your spouse get mad at you. Be like, hey, babe, chill. I know you're mad at me, but don't be mad at me. Be mad at the devil. It's not me, it's the sin living in me. So just chill. Like, see how that goes for you and call me, okay? Let me know how it works out for you. But there is this thing in Paul, and there's this thing in you, and there's this thing in me that wants to do something right, but ends up doing the exact opposite. And today I, I want to I wanna take us through what I'm, I'm calling four levels of obedience. Four levels of obedience to help you accomplish the assignment God has given you. Today's message is not to beat you up for disobedience. Today's message is to help you become keenly aware of the assignment God has given you. 
you were put on this planet, not just in a generic way, in Dallas, in Louisville, in Frisco, in McKinney, in DeSoto, in Duncanville. You live where you live for a reason. You work where you work for a reason. You go to the gym you go to for a reason. You shop at Kroger for a reason. You go, no, 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 I'm a Costco brother. You a Costco brother for a reason. None of it's on accident. You were designed. And I want to help make sure that you accomplish the assignment God has given you. In the law, or in Jewish culture, be called the mitzvah. The law is considered 613 commandments. You find this in the first five books of the Bible. 613 commandments. 365 of the commandments are negative. One for every day of the year, okay? Here's all the stuff you can't do. 248 are positive commandments. Here's all the stuff I, I want you to do. Uh, a friend of mine uh, recently uh, read the whole Bible uh, in 2023, and at the end of 2023, I said, hey, what, what's your takeaway? Like, you just read the whole thing. It's fresh in mind. What is your biggest takeaway? He said, dude, it's like one-third of the Bible is prophets going, hey, go this way. <laughs> You're going the wrong way. And it's God trying to get our attention to say, I've got a better way for you. Like if you've ever read the Bible, if you ever heard the Bible taught and just, I ain't doing that, you crazy. That don't make no sense to me. You're not alone. They're in the Bible too, okay? Like they were going, God, I hear your plan, but mine's better, which is laughable. And we would never say that out loud, but we live that way because we just rather do our own thing. Perhaps today's message is God going, hey, let me save you. Let me rescue you. Um, some of us think that obeying God is um, connected to how we obeyed our parents because our parents were constantly trying to modify our behavior. And so, but a lot of us are trying to modify our kids' behavior because of how their bad behavior might make us look in public. So get your act together because you're making me look bad because your behavior is a reflection of me. And so sometimes we think that same way with God. Like, oh, our, our behavior is going to make God look better. God don't need your help looking good. I promise you that. You obeying God is not for God. You obeying God is for your benefit. He's trying to keep you from making decisions that make you cry yourself to sleep. He's trying to help you have less regrets. He's trying to make sure that you don't have such dark secrets that it makes you a liar for life. You don't want to go there. This is God going, no, 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 no. I'm trying to save you from a lot of heartache. Turn to me, follow me. I've got a better plan for your life and the idol you might bow down to is not on your side. I am. And so today I wanna to walk us through four levels. You are going to find yourself on one level or another. And I'm simply gonna challenge you to level up. Level number one, no obedience. <laughs> This is level one. Level number one is no obedience. This is where you tell God, nah, I'm good. Like, I don't know if you've ever told God no. Hey, start serving. Nah. Hey, you should give more. You lost your mind? Nah. Forgive. Do you know what they did? No. Apologize. They owe me an apology, Jesus. No. Like, I don't know if you've ever told God no, but if you did, I'm not going to beat you up. If you've told God no, I'm going to show you that there's somebody in Scripture that you can relate to who also told God no. His name is Moses. Exodus 3, verse 10, God comes to Moses and says, Now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Here's what Moses said. But Moses said to God, Who am I? that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt. Who am I? But I just want you to see how God responds to who am I. Verse 12 says, and God said, I will be with you. And this will be a sign to you that it is I who have sent you. And you have brought the people out of Egypt. You will worship God on this mountain. You would think that a heavenly father who has 
A guy like Moses coming to him going, who am I? You would think God would tell him who he is. You'd think he'd encourage him. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let let me tell you, you are the head and not the tail. Oh, let me tell you, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Oh, let me tell you, you've got the strength. You can do it, Moses. I believe in you. Let's go. But that ain't what he said. This is how God responds to Moses' question, who am I? All, All God says is, I will be with you. Well, God, you didn't actually answer his question. It's because Moses is asking the wrong question. The better question is, who is God? And if God is on your side, then what I've asked you to do, that's all that even matters. I have found that most people live at no obedience not because they're bad, not because they're evil. Most people say no to God because they're insecure. They get to a place and they go, I I heard you, but who am I? Do you know how I grew up? The the mission impossible that you want me to go on seems like it's better suited for somebody else. In in fact, if you want a great Netflix entertainment, just read Exodus 3 and 4. It is Moses going back and forth with God, trying to give him every excuse in the book for God not to use him. And then we get to Exodus 4 verse 13, and Moses just finally tells God how he really feels. I love it. it. Moses says this. He says, Pardon your servant, Lord. Excuse me, your grace. Please send someone else. I mean, he just, he, he's telling us how I really, God, I hear you. But you, you're a great God. I get that. But I'm good. I'm good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I ain't got time for this Pharaoh stuff. I, listen, you should find somebody else who's a little bit more willing, a little bit more talented, a little bit more obedient because it ain't me. So why don't you go find somebody else? But no. Moses, tag, you're it. (laughs) Moses is a murderer. He's a fugitive. He's Pharaoh's most wanted. His life is a mess. God's going, good. I like using messes. The messier, the better, because then they'll know it was me. And not you. I get why someone might live at level one of no obedience. Because sometimes what God has asked you to do is scary. Sometimes what God has asked you to do is challenging. Uh, The number one thing I see, Carrie, about what God often asks us to do is that it's lonely. It's hard to go this way when all your friends are going this way. When everybody's cutting corners at work, you're like, but it would just be easy. But God's going, no, I'm calling you to be different. But I'd rather be obedient and pray by myself and worship by myself and believe by myself and encourage by myself. Sometimes what God has called you to do is a lonely place. So I don't beat you up for living at level one. I get it. But my prayer today is that you have the courage to take your obedience to another level. We have the luxury of knowing how Moses' story ended. If you don't know how Moses' story ended, imagine Fast and Furious with chariots and a Red Sea parting. Crazy. You should read it sometime. It's incredible. It's one of the greatest stories in human history that Moses got to be a part of, and he never would have if God left him alone. You want to know what I love about God? Is he didn't let Moses go, and he hasn't let you go. And the reason I know that is because you're here today. And some of you, it's like God keeps going, hey. It's as if God continues to tap you on your shoulder. Hey, what you think about my plan today? Huh? What you think about my plan today? No, get somebody else. Yeah, but they're not you. I like you. I made you. I saved you. I rescued you. God brought you here today for a reason. Somebody sent you this message today for a reason. So perhaps you might need to move to level two obedience, which is 
We got no obedience at level one. Level two, selective obedience. You ever ask your kids to do something and they do it? Kind of. I mean, did they technically do it? They technically did it. Did they do it right? Yes, a stretch. Our version of clean is different than their version of clean. Sometimes they don't just have selective listening. Sometimes they got selective visibility. You know what I mean? When they lose their cell phone, they got 20-20 vision. Hey, hey, they, y'all, y'all seen this? Hey, hey, man, what's up, man? Where's my phone? You got my phone? Where's my phone at? Where's my phone at? But when it's time to clean, socks everywhere. You don't see these socks under the bed? I didn't see it. Oh, yo, yo, you, got, you got blurred vision now? You need contacts? What's going on? Help me understand. Sometimes we can get to a place where our God is kind enough to us to open his mouth and speak to us, and we will partially do what he's asked us to do. In 1 Samuel 15, God commanded King Saul through the prophet Samuel to destroy the Amicalites completely, including their livestock. Scripture tells us in 1 Samuel 15, verse 7, it says, Saul defeated the Amicalites from Havilah as far as Shur, which is east of Egypt. He captured Agag, the king of the Amicalites, alive, though he totally destroyed all the rest of the people with the sword. Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and the oxen, the fatlings, the lambs, And everything that was good. And they were not willing to destroy them entirely. But everything that was undesirable or worthless, they destroyed completely. I mean, he did what God asked him to do. Kind of. It's his obedience, but his mixtape. You know what I mean? Like, he's like, listen, I'm going to do what God asked me to do. I'm going to sprinkle what I want to do as well. Some of us be like, Uh, Love your neighbor. It says neighbor, not neighbors, so I'm going to pick one that I like the most. It don't say love your zip code. It says love your neighbor. So I get to pick, right? Yeah, I get to pick. I'm going to do it my way, singular, love your neighbor. I get to pick the neighbor that I like the most. Uh, I'm not going to tell you what to do. I'm going to ask you what has God asked you to do. I'm just here to encourage you to obey. I don't believe this is a one-size-fits-all. What has God asked you to do in regard to your relationships? What has God asked you to do? I'm just going to encourage you to obey. What has God called you to do in regards to your church? Has God been nudging you? Has God been tapping you on the shoulder saying, I want you to be planted here. I want you to be engaged. I want you to to have a community around you. I want you to to serve. And and perhaps you've negotiated with God. God, how about I just come? You ought to be grateful I'm even going to church, okay? But that's not actually what he asked you to do. Have you done what God asked you to do as regards to your faith? Perhaps the Lord's been calling you to get deeper into his word, study his word which means you need more than a Bible to be able to pull that off. But you're like, no, nah, I'm not even going to buy the concordance. I'm not, I'm, I'm not even going to look it up. I, I just, you should be glad I'm even reading the Bible at all. But when you begin negotiating with God, he's no longer Lord. He's a consultant who gives suggestions. This is selective obedience. What has... God asked you to do in your career. What has God asked you to do in your budget? You say, God, I know you want me to put you first, but how about seventh? It's better than not on the list at all. And here's the deal. I get it. But at some point, you got to ask, is that the relationship that you want to have with your God? Because here's what I see a lot. Sometimes we'll do our own thing and then blame God for the results. God's going, whoa, whoa, how are you going to blame me for your foolishness? I was, don't go this way. You went, now you mad at me? No, 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 go the other direction. God's trying to arrest your attention because he has a better plan for your life than you do. Now, selective obedience is better than no obedience. But I got to tell you, it's not a place you want to move in. 
It's not a place you want to live. Some of us find ourselves living at the address of not just no obedience, not just selective obedience, but level three, slow obedience. I'm going to obey God eventually. I'm going to obey God on my timeline. I have a schedule. I got stuff to do. My life plan. I'll obey God when my kids graduate. I'm going to do it. Relax. You know my heart. But once again, if it's on your timeline, who's God here? Who's Lord here? I love what it says in Jonah chapter 1, verse 1. It says, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. He said, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. Which, by the way, sometimes we knock Jonah, but if God gave you this mission to say, hey, uh, go to Stonebriar Mall and call out their wickedness, you wouldn't do it either. So it, it is what it is. <laughs> Um, verse 3 says, it says, but Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Not only is he walking in disobedience, he's paying for it. Do you know the lengths you have to go to to get out of the will of God? He at the boat with Apple Pay, like, hey, man, y'all take black card. What you got? I got to get out of here, man. Let's roll. If you're going to disobey God, disobey God for free. Don't let it cost you to. Now, verse 4 is interesting. Verse 4 is very interesting. It says, then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break. Can I submit something to us all this weekend? Slow obedience to what God has called you to do might come at the expense of everybody else in the ship with you. Slow obedience may cost your family an unnecessary storm. Because you think that your obedience to God only has to deal with you. But it's also got to do with everyone else around you. The assignment God has given you, guess what is on the other end of that assignment? Somebody. And the more you delay it, the more that it's going to be delayed for them. But here's the best part about Jonah. Jonah 3 verse 1, it says, Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Oh, would you look at somebody on your left and your right and say, a second time. Sometimes you need a second time. Sometimes you need a third time. Sometimes you need a fourth time. Sometimes you need a fifth time. But I love the Lord's patience with us. I love that the Lord is going, I, I, let's try this. One more time. He says, go to this great city of Nineveh and proclaim the message I give you. Verse 3 says, Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. A couple questions I have for you this weekend. Uh, what did God ask you to do? But secondly, when did God ask you to do it? I want you to write this stuff down. I want you, I want you to just begin to think, man, what, 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 what have I been delaying? What have I been reluctant to do? What is my next step of faith? I want you to write it down. Then I want you to write, when did God first put this on my heart? How long has the Lord been trying to get a hold of my life? And if your answer is 1985, <laughs> my God. It's a long time. But our timelines are very interesting, and God is not confound by them at all. So I don't want you to feel like it's too late to say yes to God. You go, no, Ryan, I've been, I've been running the other direction for a very, very long time. It's never too late to hit the UE. So today, hit the UE. Not what did he just ask you to do. Not just when did he ask you to do it. How did he ask you to do it? And obey 
uh, write a book. How many of you, uh, God's put it on your heart to write a book at some point in your life? Just look around. Just look around. Just look around. Some of you don't even want to raise your hand because you don't want me to hold you accountable in the future. And I saw some of your faces. I'm looking at you. They tell me, Uh, perhaps God's called you to start a YouTube channel, a TikTok ministry. Maybe it's to start giving at a ridiculous level. Oh, by the way, people that give ridiculous, uh, you should meet them sometime. By the time you get done talking to them, you're going to say, you're actually a genius. And this crazy thing that God asked you to do actually ain't all that crazy. You'd be surprised. I have never met anybody that said the following. <laughs> Dude, life was so good, and then I started obeying God, and it just got crazy. I don't know. <laughs> I've watched plenty of people do their own thing and wake up 10 years later and go, man, I wish I would have just not listened to my friends, but if I wish I would have paused and listened to God. So whether it's a business, a ministry, a book, a mastermind, What are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? Are you waiting for the right connections? Are you waiting for ideal circumstances? You know, the thing that I often hear the most whenever I'm talking to people about doing the thing that God called them to do is the number one thing. I hear this a lot, April. I hear this all the time. They are waiting for a mentor. They are waiting for somebody else to show them the way. To say, here's the blueprint. Here's the map. This is how you do it. Which I pray you get. But more than likely, you're not going to get it. What would you do if I told you that God would be the connection you need? What would you do if I told you God would be the mentor you need? What would you do if I told you that God never called you to follow somebody else's blueprint? What would you do if I told you God called you to pick up a shovel and pave your own way and dig and make a path for somebody Again, I don't knock people that are in disobedience because they're in disobedience because they don't think that they have all the ingredients they need to accomplish what God has called them to do. I just came today to just remind you that you have everything you need if you are truly surrendered to the Most High God. I'm simply trying to encourage you to obey what God has called you to do. I've discovered that you can obey God's direction at God's pace, but do it in your own way. I'm going to start giving more this, this year, Lord. I'm going to start giving more. Yep. And then you cheat on your taxes to do it. Please don't. Don't do that. Don't do that. Please, please don't do that. Please don't do that. Please don't. Please don't. But you can say, I'm going to do it my way. You can obey God's direction, but at your own pace, in a God way. Uh, I've heard, I've, heard I've, I've got friends of mine that go, man, I'm going to propose soon. When? When I get my money right. As soon as I get my money right, we're going to be good. Okay? When you get your money right. But you the best dressed broke person I've ever known in my whole life. <laughs> so is it, is it a delay or is there an actual fear? That we can be honest about to say, hey, I, I get you want to do God's thing and you've got this godly person, but, but you kind of want to do it at your pace. And then I've learned that you can... Disobey God's direction, call it God's pace, believing it's God's way. And what we will do is we will cloak it with scripture to make it sound better. This is what it sounds like. Whenever, be nice, Ryan, be nice, be nice, be nice, be nice, be nice. Okay. Whenever, Carrie, do not get me in trouble. Listen, um, sometimes I meet lazy Christians. And they use the phrase, I'm just waiting on the Lord. 
it sounds spiritual. And then they start talking about eagle's wings and they're flapping around. And... But again, it's not that you're bad. It's, it's, you've got some insecurities. You're scared. It's challenging. It's hard. It's not that you're evil. It's just that you're, you're looking for scriptural excuses not to be who God's called you to be. Maybe you are waiting on the Lord. Who am I? What do I know? I just doubt it. To be fair, I just doubt it. I think God's waiting on you. I think God's waiting on you to make a move. I can't tell you how many people I've talked to, they're like, Man, I know I need to get this website going, man. I know I need to get this website going, but man, you know, I'm just waiting on the right connections, man. I got to meet somebody that knows how to build a website, man. I'm just, I'm just waiting on God, man. I'm just waiting on God to bring the right resource. I'm just waiting on God. Would you just buy the URL? It's $11.99. What are you doing? GoDaddy.com. Move. Make a move. Like, start making a direction. It's like, man, I know I got this book, man, but I just, man. And, and, okay, call it writer's block. But don't call it waiting on God. But I can just imagine some authors in this room that go sit down at a laptop and say, Lord, would you meet me here? I don't know how to write a book. She don't know how to do a lot of things. God will meet you there anyways. And, and here's the deal. Maybe, maybe this year isn't the year you actually write the book. Maybe this is the year you write an outline, which is 12 lines. Let's put the cookies on the bottom shelf. I'm trying to get you in an activated mode. I do not want you on the sidelines. God has an assignment for your life. And I do not want you watching other people accomplish their assignment while you cheer for them. When he's given you an assignment, baby, you were not meant for the sidelines. You weren't. God has a plan, a specific, unique plan for your life, and I don't want you to miss it. God's direction, God's pace, God's way. I know it's hard, but when you do it, you're going to wake up one day and never regret obeying God. Level one, no obedience. Level two, selective obedience. Level three, slow obedience. Level four, daily obedience. I know if you're super spiritual, you're like, nope, that's the only one we should have. Relax, okay? Relax. I live in reality. And some people take a minute because it's hard and it's scary. And it's hard to pull off when you don't have a front row seat to seeing what it looks like. I wish we all could make one decision. One decision, one act of obedience that would set us up for the rest of our life. But when it comes to obedience, it's a long game. It's a daily game. I love how Mark Batterson describes it in one of his books as he's talking about our journey with God. He uses this phrase, long obedience in the same direction. Which means that you and I, step by step, day by day, might be tempted to go the wrong direction. But you and I can make the decision to say, you know what, I, every single day, Lord, I want to do what you want me to do. Luke 9, 23 says, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. And that's hard. But, but here's what I know to be true. Here's what I know about you and here's what I know about me. If we could see what God sees, Obeying what he asked us to do, it makes so much sense. Like if we knew how it would end, we'd go, well, of course. I'm going to say yes to God, obviously. But because we can't see what he can't see, it makes it difficult. I love what James 4, 17 says. It says, if anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. Which for me is going to be challenging because this is probably my number one sin. Because I am shoulda, coulda, woulda, oughta, and I'd just be like, Pfft. 
I'll be hitting God with all kinds of excuses all the time. Like, God, I'm tired. I just got done preaching. Like, I ain't got time for all of this nonsense. Come on. Like, I, I'm, like, like I'm like checking these boxes in my mind. Like, come on, man. Like, like let me do like, Give me some space, man. They're annoying. You made them. You know this. I'm just like, this is crazy. <laughs> but every now and then I got to, I got to die to what Ryan wants daily. Oh, the other day, a, a major airline <clears throat> approached me and said, Ryan, we'd love to have you come speak. I said, yeah, that'd be, that'd be awesome. They said, but we want to hear you speak first. So we're going to come to one of your events, hear you speak, and then we'll decide if we have you. I said, all right, no pressure. Yeah, come on, let's do it. And so they come to Atlanta and they come and hear me speak. And then they come in the back. They say, hey, that was phenomenal. I spoke for 30 minutes that day. They said, hey, you did an amazing job in 30 minutes. However, what we would like you to do for our 900 leaders is closer to three hours. I said, that's a long time, but that's fine. They said, have you ever done something like that for this many people? Now, in the business world, you're supposed to lie and be like, yeah, of course. That's what we always do. But I put my head down, and I thought, you know, I could lose this opportunity. So let's lose it if I need to. Have I ever done anything like this for this large of a group? Nope. And he looked at me. I'll never forget what he said. He said, you didn't lie. He goes, you didn't lie. I said, would you want to work with a liar? Who would? Would you want to be married to a liar? Would you want to be friends with a liar? Uh, Let me ask you this. In what area of your life are you okay with having a liar? You don't want your doctor to be a liar. That'd be messed up. Ooh. <laughs> You're good. <laughs> man, something on my leg. Man, you, you need... Doc, are you sure? <laughs> I wish I wasn't tempted to lie. I wish I could tell you that when I gave my life to the Lord, I was like, I'm, I don't, don't deal with it. I don't, I, don't, I don't never lie. What you talking about? I ain't even tempted to lie. I wish I wasn't tempted to cut corners. I wish I wasn't tempted to not have integrity. But I... I think at the end of the day, you and I have to come to grips with Romans 12, 11. I don't care what you believe. At the end of the day, this is where my theology begins and ends. Romans 12, 11. It is written, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me. Every tongue will acknowledge God. So then... Each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. I ain't trying to impress you or nobody else because I don't answer to you and I will never give an account to you. I will give one to an almighty God. And in that moment, I got to ask you, what's your story going to be? I meet a lot of people who have walked away from what God has asked them to do because they're mad at their pastor. To which I would say, I get why you're mad at your pastor. I get it. I get it. I get it. Like, listen, pastors aren't perfect. I get And I know you saw a documentary on Netflix about some other pastor. And, and I get it. It messed you up. I get it. I get it. I get it. But. I do have to wonder, is that what you're going to tell Jesus one day? (laughs) So why didn't you live for me? You wouldn't even believe it. Ryan, I heard this guy Ryan one time, and he's totally Ryan. I can't stand him. You didn't follow me because of a dude named Ryan? By the way, Ryan's my friend. Don't talk about Ryan like that. But what Ryan got to do with your calling? And so some of the gripes that we have. I saw some Christians posting this on Facebook. I get it. But is that what you're going to tell? J-E-S-U-S? Is that what you're going to tell Yahweh? You're going to tell El Shaddai because of Facebook? You walked away from him? I get how you feel. I get I get it. I get that it bothers you. I get it. But one day, you and I both will stand before an almighty God. 
and give an account. And in that moment, I don't know what your story is going to be. This is why I work so hard. When I stand before the Lord, I want to hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. I left it all on the earth. I tried to help as many people as I possibly could know you. I did everything in my power. I tried to lift up your name. I did everything in my power to get as many people as I know right here at your throne. Not because I'll stand before you, but because I'll stand before God. I love what Jesus says in Luke 6, verse 46. He says, what good does it do for you to say, I am your Lord and Master, if you don't put into practice what I teach you? He says, let me describe the one who truly follows me and does what I say. He is like a man who chooses the right place to build a house. And then he lays a deep and secure foundation. When the storms and floods rage against that house, it continues to stand strong and unshaken through the tempest. For he built it wisely on the right foundation. But the one who has heard my teaching and does not obey it, is like a man who builds a house without laying any foundation at all. When the storms and floods rage against that house, it will immediately collapse and become a total loss. And then Jesus asked a question I want to close this message with. Which of these two builders will you be? Which one? Which of these two builders will you be? Will you be the one that says, Lord, whatever you have for me, I want it? Or will you be the kind of builder that just does your own thing? Here's what Jesus is assuring us of in this text. Storms are coming. And in that moment, what will your house be built of? What foundation will it be on. This weekend, my family and I had the wonderful opportunity to celebrate my mother's 75th birthday party. And uh, it's, it's been such a fun weekend. Got so many amazing family and friends in town. My godparents are here. The people that have been praying for me since before I was born are, are in the building. Would you, would you give a hand clap to them as well? <laughs> Pastors Richard and Mary Coleman. Um, it's, I, I marvel at the, all that God has done in, in uh, my mother's life, and I think the testament of who a person is is who they are surrounded by. And in town is a woman uh, by the name of Wilma Taylor. Wilma is about to be really, really mad at me right now. I'm just telling you that right now, okay? She's in the building um, because I'm going to tell you her age. I'm not supposed to do that, but I, there is a point, okay? I just, I just want you to know that Wilma is 88 years old. <laughs> See, they clap for you so you can't be as mad at me, okay? So just relax, okay? And uh, we had some people over to the house Friday night, and we were all just talking and, and having uh, some intentional conversations. And I watched my Aunt Wilma speak into my mother's life. And the first thing I thought was, I hope at this age I still have friends like this. I hope. I, that's my prayer. And then... Um, she, uh, Aunt Wilmo, is a part of a, an association that I just so happened to be speaking at their event about two weeks ago in San Antonio. It's about 800 leaders in there, and Wilmo was one of them. And full circle moment, she's sitting in our living room, and she's encouraging my mom, and she says, I remember when I called you and prophesied that you would have these boys. And this is what she says. She said, I have watched God be faithful to your husband, and now I'm watching God be faithful to your boys. And then she said, Ryan, and now I'm looking at your boys. And here's, 
Here's my prayer for you. Here's my prayer for me. I pray that God would let me live long enough to see his goodness in multiple generations. That I would live long enough to see the full movie because I never got to see my dad in his prime. Wilma did. And Wilma's here today. And there's times where I worry, if I'm honest. I'm like, Lord, I, are you this good? Aunt Wilma's like, baby, he been good long before you was born. <laughs> and he'll be good long after you're gone. I'm going to encourage you to obey God because you don't know what your obedience today might mean for somebody else in the future. And maybe there's somebody in your life that has a front row seat to that movie that could go, hey, I watched you be obedient in 2024 and it didn't start making sense until 2044, but I've watched that daily obedience all the way home. My prayer for us today is that whatever God's asked us to do, we say yes. You won't regret it, and it won't be easy, but it'll be the greatest decision you've ever made in your life. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I'm going to give each and every person an opportunity to make Jesus the Lord and Savior of your life. You talk about decisions. I can't think of a better one than to make Jesus the Lord of your life. Perhaps you're here today and you weren't planning on coming. Let me tell you who did plan on you coming. Jehovah Jireh. God Almighty planned for you to be here, planned for you to be watching this message. And I believe you're just not here on accident. I believe today maybe is an opportunity for you to say, I want to make Jesus the Lord of my life. Or perhaps you want to get back on track. Maybe you had a season where you were following the Lord, and maybe you had a season where you simply walked away. Today's your opportunity to come back. If that's you today, would you just slip up your hand and say, hey, Ryan, that's me. Ryan, that's me. Today I want to surrender my life to Christ. If that's you, would you just slip up your hand? I see your hand. That's awesome. Anybody else? I see your hand over there. That's awesome. Oh, I see three hands right there. That's awesome. Anybody? I see you all the way up there. That's awesome. I see you. I see you. Anybody else? I see those two hands there. I see some hands over there. I think I got nine, ten. That's awesome. Anybody else? Anybody else? Eleven, twelve, thirteen. That's awesome. Anybody else? We'll wait for you. We'll wait for you. Oh, yeah, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen. That's awesome. Anybody else? Eighteen. That's awesome. Anyone else? Anyone else? Lord, you see those 20 hands that just went up, and the heavens are rejoicing because of a lifted hand that says, I surrender. So, Father, we give you these lives. Father, we surrender. If you raise your hand, would you repeat this prayer after me? Say, Jesus, thank you for dying on a cross for my sins. I ask now that you would be my Lord and Savior. I receive what you have done for me. You took my place, and I will serve you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody say it. Amen. Come on, can you make some noise for every single person that gave their heart to the Lord? Best decision you've ever made. Go ahead and stand to your feet. Hey, if you prayed that prayer for the first time, I want you to text the phrase saved to this number 54636, or you can scan that QR code, and we're going to send you a little devotional, a little booklet that'll just kind of help you go through the next seven days of your life now that you've made this incredible decision. Once again, can we make some noise for every single person that gave their heart to Christ? Uh, if we could pray for you, our prayer team is going to be down here uh, praying for people. If you're a Cowboys fan, you get first dibs. Um, and I pray that you have a, a very safe weekend, have some fun with family. 
and friends. And I pray that whatever assignment God has given you, that you would simply daily obey. Can I bless you? May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And may he cover you with his precious name, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Have a great week.